what we're trying to do is just remember, come back to our original state of consciousness, which is called Christian consciousness. In order to do so, there are different activities which will help invoke our natural Christian consciousness. Brother writes in the Nectar of Devotion, these are called Sadhana Bhakti. And in the beginning, there are 64 different processes of Sadhana Bhakti that are mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion. And of those, there are five powerful processes which can invoke even ecstasy, even the heart of a neophyte, if they're executed with sincerity. So those five are especially the chanting of the Holy Name. Basically, we're trying to convince people to chant Hare Krishna. And not only to convince people to chant Hare Krishna, but we're trying to instruct them, as well as ourselves, how to chant Hare Krishna in such a way as that we're actually asking, sincerely, Lord Krishna and Shimati Rarani to engage us in their loving service. Of course, people in general have, really don't know very much about Krishna what to speak of Srimati Rarani, what to speak of what we mean by loving devotional service. We ourselves may not be that much aware of what these things mean either. On the other hand, the neophyte devotee, well, the five powerful processes of chanting the Holy Name, worshiping the deities, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, serving the devotees, and living in a holy place such as Mathura Vrindavan. So in this age, especially the chanting of Hare Krishna, creates an atmosphere by which, even in the middle of a materialistic city, the atmosphere changes and becomes spiritualized. So that by chanting Hare Krishna, one could be Krishna conscious anywhere. And we're trying to teach people how to come to that platform, by how to make the atmosphere spiritual, so that even if we're not living in Vrindavan, or Mathura, or Jagannath Puri, still by chanting Hare Krishna, or by installing the deities and worshipping them, or by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Charitamrita, then the atmosphere can become spiritualized, and therefore peoples will not be under the external energy we and others will be under the internal energy of Krishna. So Prabhupada emphasized three things in order to spiritualize the atmosphere. One of them was chanting the holy name, and therefore Harinam Sankirtan. The other is things like, well, distributing transcendental literatures. And of course, things don't, our preaching doesn't stop there. We also want people to come to the temple, worship the deity, chant the holy name, or in their own home, install the deity and chant the holy name, and hear regularly Shrimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita. So this is our preaching work. We're, it doesn't stop with just giving people a book. It also goes to convincing us to apply the process within our lives, so that we become aware of the value of the books, we become aware of the value of the deities, we become aware of the value of the holy name, we become aware of the value of associating with the devotees and making the atmosphere transcendental or spiritual. But if we don't, or as it says, archam e harye, pujam yakshadaye hate, etadhaneshu chanyeshu, sabakta prakrita smritaha. For those who are neophyte devotees or prakrita bhaktas, and Prakrita Bhakta is not bad because Prakrita Bhakta, Krishna says, Chatura Vida Bhajan Demam Jana Sakritina Arjuna Arte Jignasya Artarati Gyani Chabharatar Shiva. Generally, people approach God if they're pious, if they're in distress. Those who are in distress, because everyone's in distress, who don't approach Krishna, they're known as mudhas. They don't even know why they're in distress. And therefore they keep on with the same activities that cause distress, thinking that these will cause happiness. 
So madness is called, is called when you think you can, you're going to do the same thing over and over again and get a different result. That's called madness. So the mudhas are those who are mad, more or less. They're foolish. And because they engage in activities which are in the search of happiness, which will make them more distressful, that Prahlad Maharaj calls them vimudhas, super asses. <laughs> so when the ass approaches Krishna in a humble spirit, then he becomes a arti, he become, or arta arti, one who is in distress and wants to finish his distress. Generally speaking, by chanting Hare Krishna even a little bit, and reading Prabhupada's books and taking Bhushanam, one gradually becomes convinced to follow the regular principles. Especially no meat eating and fish and eggs, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling. So by these processes, then one gradually gets free from his distress, because the very things that people think will make them happy going to McDonald's, hamburgers, and engaging in sinful activity, sense gratification, taking intoxication. These things that they think will make them happy are actually the causes of the distress. So when a person is fortunate enough to come in contact with the devotees and understands that one should at least practice Krishna consciousness enough to get the spiritual strength to avoid sinful activities, then he's the beginning of the neophyte platform. But generally such neophytes, if they don't engage in the preaching work, somehow or another assisting the pre preaching work, they usually turn into Naradamas, those who understand the preliminary processes of sense and mind control, become somewhat civilized, but because they're not sincere enough to ser about their service to Krishna, generally they become disinterested and becoming too serious about Krishna consciousness, and therefore they stop the actual process of sadhana bhakti. But still they keep some of their activities, like they remain a vegetarian, or they don't take so much intoxication. So they become Naradamas, those who took to the process in the beginning to serve Krishna. But later on, although they appear to be civilized, they gave up the process and simply refined their sense gratification. But those who keep up with the process, somehow or another, is sadhana bhakti. Generally speaking, when they get some spiritual strength, then they're able to restrain themselves from sinful activities, and then they think of ways of making, improving their material circumstances. Not only avoiding distressful circumstances, but how to make a, come to the platform of a little bit more of goodness, where they can enjoy life a little bit better. And generally such devotees, they become convinced that they should live a, more, live a more purified life, get up earlier, for instance, go to sleep earlier, get more restful sleep. They realize the value of the, how to refine the basic activities like eating. They eat in a more controlled way. They don't only, you know, eat ten samosas and you know, whatever it is. They control their senses a little bit more. They drink water regularly, they learn how to breathe, they do a little exercise, whatever. They know what is the process of living life in such a way as to have a little bit more refined life, which is more or less comfortable, more comfortable. But if they don't preach, then generally speaking, then they simply become in the mode of goodness and they become Brahm like more Brahminical. But because they eventually get tired of helping others, so therefore they usually wind up as Maya Pritagyanists. In other words, even we refine our devotional service or we come to a higher platform like we become, Krishna says the next one is Jignasa, inquisitive. So they, after living life a little bit more purified, we take vitamins, we have our health checkup, we eat proper food, we learn how to breathe, we have nice relationships with people, we're a little civilized, we think before we talk, we don't just tell people what's on our mind all the time, prajalpa. 
then the result is that one becomes interested in studying the books, because one, Prabhupada's literature, because one sees that there's some refinement, further refinement that can be done by seeing things spiritually. So they become jignasa. But if they give up the preaching work, because then generally the jignasus, they become, well, they don't really see, they see things spiritually, but ultimately they see things of how to liberate themselves from all material entanglement and obligations, and they even give up service to Krishna. Therefore, in one sense, they become atheistic. But if one can continue on and become liberated from material concepts of life, then one comes to the platform of, of a real Gyani. And from that platform, one can become, begin real devotional service. But even one who is a Gyani, one who understands how everyone is Krishna's servant, then he becomes the most enthusiastic preacher because his reason for preaching and performing devotional service is not for his personal benefit, but as a service to Krishna please Krishna. But in every step we have to practice sadhana bhakti and then try to apply it. So applying it, of course, means, Krishna says, the second class platform where one is actually applying more strictly the teachings and that application is on the platform of devotion. And for the second class platform it's uh, Ishvara Thad Adineshu Valisheshu, Dutsatsucha, Prema Maitri, Kripo Peka, Yakuroti, Samadhi Maha. One has to learn on the second class platform how to recognize different classes of devotees. So the second class platform is more or less the platform of liberation. But of course, if we <coughs> try to act on a higher platform than we're currently situated, then we make more rapid progress. If we're satisfied just to come to the temple and worship the deities, and even attend the classes sometimes, but if we don't take seriously the instructions, then the result is that we never develop real spiritual vision. And for us, it doesn't matter what anyone says in the class, we don't understand what they're saying very well, and we're not interested in understanding. Therefore, because we're not interested and we don't understand, we don't really make any real progress, and after some time it becomes boring, because we think it's a very simplistic philosophy. Therefore, such devotees, usually, they only come to class when the speaker is going to tell stories and entertain them. They think, why should I hear all this philosophy? I already know all the philosophy. We're not the body. Krishna is God. All these details. We don't really need them. We just want to be entertained. Get some pious activities. And in our next life, lifetime, we can go to heaven and enjoy. So therefore, one has to understand, if we want to go to a higher platform, we have to learn how to discriminate. And that discrimination is not, this person's a good person, this person's a bad person, this person I can criticize. It's not that kind of discrimination. No, the discrimination is who's on what level of devotional service. And what are the symptoms? Even in leadership sometimes in our society, they, they don't want to discriminate. They're all, you know, so because we've, we've been brought up in an impersonalistic culture, a materialistic culture, which is tends towards impersonalism. Therefore, we artificially think, if I don't discriminate, then I'm on a very high platform. But the fact is, we're always discriminating, but we're discriminating on a very low platform. We can't stop discriminating. Otherwise, why do people, if we're such a high platform, we don't discriminate? Why do we walk across the street? Why don't we just, we don't discriminate what the cars are, we don't bother looking. Whether they're coming this way or that way, it makes no difference to us. No, we look both ways, because we're discriminating. Similarly, everyone we see, whatever they're doing, we discriminate. If someone has a knife in their hand, and they're not going to the kitchen, <laughs> then we don't think, well, there's a knife, or if you had a, a bead bag, it makes no difference. <laughs> <laughs> so we're always discriminating, because that's the nature of our relationship with Krishna. We're always asking questions, 
and Krishna is always giving us answers. But if we don't learn how to discriminate, what's the real value of discriminating spiritually, then we remain on the neophyte platform. So the devotee on the second class platform, first discrimination, he has to learn is what level he's on. Now, of course, we like it when people come and tell us, oh, you're all very advanced. But that's just cheating, because we're not really very advanced. And for one who's not very advanced, who people keep on praising and telling him he's advanced, then he becomes even more foolish than he already is. Just like Prithu Maharaj, he was saying, when they were all praising him, he said, this is actually an insult. You're telling me that how what these wonderful activities, but I haven't done anything yet. So this kind of praise is actually an insult when you're praising someone, like Sanatana Goswami, when he was praising his jailkeeper that you're a great sage and sadhu. <laughs> <laughs> so if you liberate me, then as you know, as it says, anyone who liberates a person or frees one from jail, he goes to the spiritual world. So because he was a fool, he would accept it in some of those moments. <laughs> Explanation of the process of liberation. <laughs> so, if we think we're actually advanced, and we're not really advanced, then we become even more foolish. And there's no possibility of making any progress. Because we don't think we have to make any progress, because I'm already there. On the other hand, if we actually discriminate, then it's not actually discouraging. We're afraid, well, if I find out I'm a neophyte and I've been in the movement for 20 years, I'll become very discouraged because I haven't made as much progress as everyone thinks I've been or should have been. You know, I have all the designations for an advanced devotee. I just don't have the consciousness. That's all. <laughs> no, we have to, without getting the proper discrimination, we won't learn how to get the proper consciousness. Therefore, the symptoms of different neophyte, intermediate, and advanced devotees are given, and they're just like an ocean of, of different subtleties to them. It's not that from day one to day ten I become a neophyte, and from day ten to day twenty I'm an intermediate. But, if we learn how to see who's advanced, or at least more advanced than I am, because there's going to be a limit to how far we can understand how someone's advanced, and we have no experience. Just like those who are associated with Prabhupada, for instance, sometimes the guy had experience, Prabhupada would come into the room, and all my anxieties would go away. I feel like I was in completely in my kunta. But that doesn't mean I've understood what the platform the Prophet was on. It means that just like if you're having, if you're near a heater, ten feet away from a heater, you can understand there's some heat coming from the heater. So therefore you can understand that whatever warmth I'm feeling would probably be a lot more if I was near into the heater. But at least the heater is on, is on and it's producing heat, and therefore I can understand that it's hotter than I am. Similarly, associating with an advanced devotee such as Prabhupada, we can understand him as much as we're advanced. But we're not going to understand this because we understand he's advanced, therefore we've understood what advanced means. We just understand he's more advanced than I am. Similarly, we should be able to at least judge who's more advanced than I am. If I look around and say everyone's lower than I am, which may be true sometimes, but I have to understand why they're lower than I am, in what way they are. If I look around and say everyone's more advanced than I am, and I have no discrimination why, then it's just artificial. Oh, everyone's more advanced than I am, I, you know, I'm the humblest person here. I'm the most No, it, real, real discrimination has to be there. So one should not be foolish and think, well, I'm just going to declare everyone's more advanced than I am. <laughs> and everyone's, oh, he's so humble, he's so advanced. Yes, yes, I'm so advanced, but I don't want to tell everyone that. 
anything. Yes. So then, one has to understand who's on the same level. But we can't see who's on basically the same level as we are. We haven't understood very much either. And who we can help, who's on a, who's a neophyte, who's more neophyte than we are. Who I'm supposed to give compassion to, and training, who I'm supposed to cooperate with, and who I'm supposed to faithfully serve without hesitation. And then we have to see people who are completely innocent, who, have a potent, who are demons in their activities now, but have a potential to become Krishna conscious. If we can't see that, then we haven't really understood what Krishna's mission is. Because after all, we, didn't, we weren't born as pure devotees either. Someone must have been able to discriminate and see us as neophyte and train, see how to train us. And then, of course, who's we're not capable of, of properly training or helping to advance in Krishna consciousness, but we'll get entangled if we deal with them too intimately. So we have to learn how to discard them. So these things are everyday occurrences. It's not that only those who go out and distribute books, they have to have this discrimination. But everyone is Krishna's servant. Even the devotees are Krishna's servants. So we have to practice discrimination 24 hours a day in order to make actual advancement in devotional service. But of course, if one goes out and preaches, then it's more of a challenge because amongst the devotees we think we know who everyone is and we think we know how to deal with them. But when we're dealing with total, what we think are total strangers, we're forced to a certain extent to rely more upon Krishna. And as our relying upon Krishna, which actually the Dami Buddhi Yogam Tam, Krishna gives us the actual spiritual discrimination how to deal with people. Of course, it depends upon our objective. If our objective is only to sell books, then he'll give us that much intelligence. If our objective is to make devotees, help people become Krishna conscious, he'll give us that intelligence also, which will include distributing books. In any case, Whenever we put ourselves more into a challenge and rely upon Krishna, the result is that Krishna can give us more help. He wants to give us as much help as we're willing to take. The problem is, we don't really feel we need so much help from Krishna. And so Krishna can't give us so much help as we think that the material nature is, is my shelter to some degree or another. So therefore I don't really have to take shelter of Krishna so much. In any case, putting oneself into a position such as where we have to approach total strangers and convince them to buy a book in a very short period of time requires a great amount of reliance upon Krishna. Matter of fact, nothing happens, practically speaking, it's auspicious happens, unless we, in the, to the degree we're actually relying upon Krishna. So that's good training, not only when we're trying to sell people books, but throughout our whole lives, we should understand that as much as I rely upon Krishna, my life becomes auspicious. And as much as I think I'm independent, then Maya, the three modes of material nature, will assist me in my conditioned life, which may not be very pleasant, especially if we have to take another body again. So, we'll stop there. Any questions? Yes. You're saying that people make progress in emotional service. Like reading Bhagavad Gita, how it's always continues somehow, or right? it's never lost. But then we also meet people that they don't want any more progress in devotional service. I'm pretty adamant against it. Really. Yeah, they probably never made very much advancement to begin with. It's not so easy to make advancement. In one sense, it's, unless we actually try to understand the process of advancement, it's very difficult to make very much advancement. But anyhow, that much advancement they made, that some, they participated to some degree in devotional activities, and maybe to some degree at one point or another they had some sincerity for devotional consciousness. But now it's been covered over by the three modes. It may take some while before they're placed in a similar position where their devotional activities and devotional consciousness are invoked again. Forgetfulness is 
very prominent in the material world. We can be in ecstasy at one moment and completely forget Krishna the next. So we shouldn't be surprised that some people are, were enthusiastic at one point in devotional service and then they lost their interest and became covered by Maya. And sometimes they become even more covered by Maya than a normal person. Just so Maya can help them forget Krishna. Because otherwise, their experience of Krishna consciousness was too intense. So Maya has to give them even a more intense material of this existence. Anything else? Yes. How do we discriminate by personal association? You know? Well, read Prabhupada's books. It's not a one word answer. We have to listen, we have to see what we're doing. We have to listen to what we're saying. We have to think about what we're, how we see things. We're not seeing through Bhagavad Gita. We're not seeing through the scriptures. Then we're seeing according to our condition. And we may be satisfied and others may be satisfied to some degree that here is a nice person, he's conditioned by the mode of goodness. But if we're satisfied like that, then we'll have to come back and again act in the mode of goodness. So unless we're actually hearing from more advanced devotees and at the same time reading the books, then we want to understand the value of what Krishna is saying in Bhagavad Gita. When he says, Deva, Dvija, Guru, Pragya, Pujanam, Socham, Arjavam, Brahmacharya, Mahimsam, Cha, Shriram, Tapa, Uchita, that uh, a stirring in goodness of the body is to worship the Supreme Lord, Deva, Dvija, and the, the, twi the Brahmins, Guru, the spiritual masters, Pragya, those who are learning, Deva, Dvija, Guru, Pragya, Pujanam, Socham, Arjavam, Brahmacharyam, celibacy, ahimsam, non violence. Brahmacharyam himsam cha shriram tapa uchate. Actually, there's one more. Socham. Deva duija guru pragya pujam socham arjavam. Socham, cleanliness and simplicity. So that's what we're seeing. Am I actually washing my hands properly before I eat? And even my feet and my mouth? Am I actually washing them properly after I eat? Is my consciousness trying to load it over others or am I actually? seeing myself as servants of others. What is my, am I consciousness trying to enjoy the material energy or trying to serve Krishna? So unless we're watching our consciousness and our activities, if we're do, well, if we're doing that, then we're discriminating on the basis of Bhagavad Gita. Anu vegam karam vakyam socham priyahitam jaya svadhyaya pyasanam chayva vangmana tapu uchite. Or austerity of speech is to say things which are not agitating. Krishna begins with not agitating. The minds of others, saying things that are truthful and beneficial and pleasing and which follow the Vedic conjunctions. So we should listen to what, how we're saying things and what we're saying and try and pray to Krishna for more intelligence so we can improve the quality of our speaking. And similarly, Manak prasadam samya tvam, monam atma vinigraha, baba samshudi ipyeta, tamo manasam uchite. Manak prasadam, satisfaction of the mind, manak prasomya tvam, without duplicity, manak prasadam samya tvam, styrium atma vinigraha, with satisfaction, enthusiasm. Bhava Samshudi uh, Mona Mono Mona with gravity and Manak Prasadam Somya Tvam Styrium Atma Vinigraha Bhava Samshudi Iketa or Mona Manak Prasadam Manak Prasadam Somya Tvam Styrium Mona Atma Vinigraha and at the same time one should Monam Atma Vinigraha, Bhava Samshadi Iketa, purification one's existence. That these are the austerities of the mind. So we should see whether I'm actually 
satisfied and therefore being able to concentrate rather than hankering or lamenting. Is my mind satisfied? Is it grave? Is it actually thinking of the instructions of Krishna? Manak prasadam, somyatvam. Is without duplicity or am I actually trying to, I'm doing one thing to get something else. So we have to watch ourselves. Where my mind is, where my words are, where my activities are. Then we'll know how to, if we're actually properly relating to others. We don't know how to do things ourselves. How we know how to relate to anyone else. So that requires we're not only trying to remember a verse, well hopefully we're trying to remember something from Bhagavad Gita. We're also trying to apply it. It's not just, you know, some game we're playing. Like Krishna, they used to have the Krishna ball game. You memorize Krishna book so you can come out as Krishna champion. <laughs> no, it's actually meant, it's more serious than that. Okay. Well, you, you were saying that uh, it's not, not only that do we remember things, but we have to learn how to apply them. So there's uh, a saying that I've heard that sometimes some are, they preach, but they don't act properly. There are some that don't act properly, but they preach. So how do you yeah, bring them together? You probably both. That was Sanatana Goswami speaking to Haridas Thakura, that some people preach, but they don't, they don't follow, and some people follow, but they don't preach, but you do both, and therefore you're the best. So we have to re therefore probably give us a morning program, and sometimes devotees attend the evening program. He gave us preaching as the goal of the society. So we have to do both. Practice. Learn how to become very better devotees, and then preach. Understand what we're preaching about. If we probably want us to hear these books regularly, so we know what we're, what we're preaching about. Learn how to hear. Hear the holy name. Hear Prabhupada's books. Therefore we know what we're trying to give to others, the, the value of it. We're not just trying to show the deities and make a living. Convince some pious Indians to come and give us a donation. So I've seen that we're worshiping the deity and pious Indians thinking, this is my ticket to heaven, here's, here's my passage to heaven, here's my... <laughs> One more question. Okay. One of your disciples was telling me he can't go on book distribution because he's always uh, been against proselytizing. So, well, his book distribution... Proselytizing, or if you're not into proselytizing. What is proselytizing? Well, people trying to convert them. Usually, that's what trying to convert them. Yes, yeah, like pushing their thing on them. Yeah, of course we're trying to push our things on them. Otherwise, they, they wouldn't get it. Whether well, everyone's trying to push their thing on others. Otherwise, why do people wear a certain T-shirt with, yeah. with things on it? Why do people dress a certain way? Or you have people with certain handcuffs. They're trying to push this thing on others. So we're also trying to push our thing on others. But we're trying to do it in such a way that people voluntarily accept it. But at first there may be a little pushing because everyone's pushing everyone. It's not like we're not pushing. All these billboards and advertising, it's not that they're not pushing. Everyone's pushing. You go to the, the school, it's not like you go to the school and they're not pushing their educational system on you. <laughs> no, as soon as you're born, someone's pushing something on you. Mm. The doctor, is, they're pushing you out, slapping you. <laughs> <laughs> so from the moment you're created, someone's pushing something on you. Your mother, whatever she eats. That's what you, it's pushed into you. So 
So this idea we don't want to push anything on others is not realistic. This means we're not very much understanding that's all. We're not convinced that the, the value of what we're doing. For others, at least. We have some conviction. It's good for me, but we don't understand really its universal application. Thank you very much, Grantaraj. Well, no, Grantaraj. Grantaraj, all the books, Kijaj. <laughs> Transcendable distribution, Kijaj.